I, I had a we had a question in Los Angeles last week where someone said, you know, the church scene, it just seems so kind of um like you're there, it's just the sweat and the, you're just like it, it's so close and intimate and and guttural, etc. I'm like, well, we only had three actors. We had a very small church, and because of COVID, we couldn't have a congregation. So it literally is that <laughs> um, you could look over to the left or right. So um, we just made a meal out of it in the end. But but, but uh, it but it works so well. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the Deadline video series, The Process. My name is Katrina Balf. I am interviewing or I'm talking to uh, Harris Zambralukas, the fantastic DP of Belfast. Hey, Harris, how are you? Hi, Katrina. Nice to see you. <laughs> how nice are you? you too. I'm good. Well, I mean, we just saw each other not that long ago in Let's Los do. Angeles, but where are you now? Back in London. So, oh, same. We should have we should have gotten the same room. What are I we doing? So. I know that would have been easier. <laughs> um, so we had the absolute pleasure of working together on Belfast, a uh, film that was written and directed by the wonderful Kenneth Branagh. And I think this is your is it your fourteenth project together? Fourteenth right? year working together. We've oh, done eight year. projects, <laughs> eight films, eight films. So. Yeah. Obviously, when you work with somebody that much, there's a shorthand and an understanding. But do you want to sort of explain how you guys first met and, and what those first projects were like together? We, we met a long time ago um, for a film called Sleuth. I think Ken had seen a few films that he uh, uh, liked. I think in particular it was Enduring Love by Roger Michel um, and, and that balloon sequence that opens the film. So we talked a lot about that, um, that film. Um, and we just hit, hit it off straight away, mainly out of a kind of love for maybe the themes of films. I think that might be the thing that binds uh, filmmakers together is uh, uh, that particular exploration of the human condition and having a kind of a similar ideas about what might be an interesting project to do and what part of humanity you want to explore. Uh, much less so the actual process of filmmaking, but the subject that we were, we were going to tackle. I think that's where we, we started talking more in depthly about. That's um, amazing. Well, I, I guess, you know, when working with the both of you, one thing that's really apparent about both of you is how soulful you both are. You know, that's one thing that sort of came across to me anyway. And and it's, I guess that's, that ties in with what I would have imagined about both of you. Well, Ken has this really great way of kind of giving you information. I'm sure you saw it too, Katrina, where like you, you get to the very heart of a project quite quickly with mm -hmm. Ken. And so uh, going back to the very first one, say Sleuth, he, he said, this is really the same as the Scottish play. And the Scottish king has one thing that he suffers from, and that's morbid jealousy. So we're making a film about morbid jealousy. Well, that straight off the bat, you've got something to talk about, something to, you know, really but you don't have to, like you can figure out cameras and lenses and uh, techniques, et cetera. But if you don't have that, you don't know where, where to go. And I think that's what we, I think we all felt on Belfast, wasn't it? Um, that we had a, a a direction to go to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think from our very first day with Ken, you know, when he got myself and, and well, I suppose it went before that, when he sent us that kind of little sizzle reel of different films that he'd been looking at to kind of send us the tone and send us the kind of, I guess the feel of what he wanted to convey, it was so apparent so quickly. You know, I think that's the most important thing. As long as you know, from the get-go what somebody is expecting of you in terms of that overriding feeling that they want to convey then you know exactly where to pitch things from from that first yeah. day what were your first conversations with ken um so i was first sent the script and then asked if i could read it very quickly and sort of get on a zoom with ken and when we first spoke um 
yeah it was it was this horrible zoom I, I just I, I'm so awkward on zoom but Ken is the most as you know like he he's just the most gentle person so we just started having this very um sort of quiet conversation about he was asking about my life and about where I was from and sort of about my family and you know he really I guess as you say like he has this very smart way of getting to the heart of things without it without it seeming like he's going there you know um and I had read the script at that point and I just loved it so much and so you know obviously we were talking about our lives in terms of Northern Ireland and how that had shaped or influenced us and um you know talking about family I suppose was was, was the main thing and then you know I, I read a scene or two with him and then um I think that was sort of it and then a week later I was heading towards well I, I knew that I was going to be heading towards uh well I thought originally we were going to be shooting in Belfast but that didn't happen um for us anyway all the group bus going in three minutes Last thing is nine. the boss has been in touch they want me to stay on a permanent job in England wanted me to move into management some more money there's a house that goes with it. We get it rent free with a chance to own it if things go well. A wee bit bigger than what we have here. A room for each of the boys. There's a wee garden too. Are you allowed to play football in that garden, Daddy? I so. If I say yes, there's more money straight away. We could start getting on top of that back tax now. This family's not going to get another chance like that in this town, not now. Hey, watch out for that traffic there. I'm watching it now, Mommy. It's okay. Come on now, two minutes. Get aboard if you're coming. Last tickets now. Sounds like they really want you. when he approached you with this particular film, you know, for me, and I'm sure for a lot of the actors, there was such a, it felt so vital because it was something from home and mm. felt so close to us. And when he approached you, what were the things, even though it's very specifically about, a, you know, Northern Ireland and Belfast, were the things that you initially hooked on to anyway with that script? Certainly there were things that I, I hooked on to straight away, but I think one of the things that was new in our relationship here is that uh, because this was such an almost confessional, earnest uh, script and so uh, personal to Ken, uh, I felt that thing, you know when someone talks to you about their past um, mm. and they confide in you, um, it just opens a kind of channel of conversation there that you feel you have to... Um, Kind of open up a little bit yeah. and reciprocate and in doing so what happens is um this kind of trust starts uh, 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 uh in our case growing after even after 14 years um in particular when we went to belfast to and we went through the streets that he grew up in and like you know that's where that's where catherine used to live and um uh, uh, yeah, we actually went and sat outside. We went to her house. That's we went to her house. We did the route from school to to home and back. Um, uh, and and we we kind of I saw where he would actually hide, um, so Amazing. he wouldn't get seen. And there's just I can't describe what a that's such a different process to anything I've ever done before. Um, and it certainly opened up kind of a new kind of gateway of 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 trust and conversation and and at the same time one of responsibility like this is my dear friend and he's making something so special and i love this script i love this story um i, I really need to uh, contribute kind of and and what can i add and what can we do to make this um as seamless effortless and as eloquent and as lucid as we possibly can i certainly had elements of my kind of childhood that seem to be not the same experience but 
um, again, in that opening up and confiding and, and, and you, you, you know, Cyprus is a troubled country. That's where I'm from. Um, Cyprus was invaded in 1974. I was four years old. Uh, my father was in the construction industry too, and we had to leave. We went to Dubai um, wow. after the invasion. So uh, the idea of growing up with a military presence, et cetera, um, uh, we eventually went back to Cyprus and my father carried on working uh, away. So I was raised with my brother with, by my, my mother. If, you know, I could see, I could certainly see kind of elements of my mother. Parallels, in, yeah. Yes, and parallels there and then the performance you gave. Um, and that, um, and I, I just, I was often moved when we were prepping and always moved when we were making this film. Um, so it was quite different to anything I've done in the past in that respect. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I, I wasn't aware that your journey had such huge similarities. I mean, I think that, well, I guess it, it's a project in some ways. You know, I think every single person who was involved found something really personal in it. You know, I mean, my family moved towards the border when I was a child, but for most of my, you know, youth and adolescence, you know, my dad wasn't away in another country, but he was working on the border. I mean, sometimes like he was there like 16, 17 hour days. Yeah. You know, my dad, he was a, a sort of absent in work so much of the time. And my mom was there raising all of us. And I definitely, you know, thought about my mother so much during this and, and mm. the burden that is placed on, on the women sometimes left behind as well as the burden. You know, I think that's what's so beautiful is that Ken managed to capture the price that everybody has to pay. You know, I'm sure it was so difficult for your father being away, Ken's father being away, even my father, you know, yeah. um, and there's an awful, an awful lot of empathy that he had for everybody in those situations. And I feel what we got through, which was nice to do in a film, is kind of um, to really give a nod to parenthood in a way, um, whether it's yours or someone else's, just the actual, you know, motherhood, fatherhood. It's a sacrifice. It's it, um, the everyday heroes that go kind of unsung um, um, throughout time. Uh, I think that really, I think that, resonated with me and I hope it kind of resonates with the audience when we show this. I mean, what have been the reactions from people when they see it? Um, what do they talk to you about when they first see the uh, film? Well, I mean, that's the, the funny thing because it, it, it felt like such a specifically Irish story, but yet bringing it out, it, it is that thing of it's resonating with everybody. You know, there is a universality to to all of that and I think it's because it's been distilled down to you know those very important but basic human things you know family love friendship all of those things um and and you know everybody I had somebody come up to me and be like you know I didn't realize Indian mums had so much in common with Irish mums and you know it's it's this thing yeah, of, yeah. which feels amazing you know you you you, you never know if, if things are going to resonate, but it really has, which has been so beautiful. Um, I want you to speak to me a bit about the, the visual language. Like, was that, what were the conversations like early on? Because for me, you know, it's funny, I get asked a lot, you know, is it different for you as an actor when you know it's going to be in black and white, which it completely isn't. You know, you're like, no, the camera's the camera. I was like, the only thing for me was that it was exciting because I, adore black and white films and something I always love watching. So, but also the, the, the quality of the black and white that you got, it was, it's so beautiful. So do you want to speak a bit about those conversations and how you landed on that particular sort of feel? Um, we, we pretty much landed on black and white early on. It, it's, th these are conversations we've had in the past with Ken. We've always had a little bit of black and white, um, <laughs> Uh, in, in, in most of our films. Um, I think in this one, we felt that this is really our film to make as we wish. So there was certainly a bit of a confidence there that it wasn't, this conversation was for us, us alone, mm -hmm. as opposed to something um, we were going to have to pitch or 
um, explain. Um, and there, there's something that we always felt about um, black and white in that it is uh, not as descriptive as color. Color has this immediate um, amazing kind of way of saying someone's eyes are blue, um, that it's autumn because um, the, leaves are, the leaves are red and just kind of it's effortless in its, and, and in its accuracy of description and it's immediate. And all those things you don't have to, in a way, explain. They just happen to be in the frame. If you use them well, um, you can get on with other parts of the, the story. But they're more often than not distractions, I find, because those descriptive kind of qualities are, in a way are necessary in films that are so intimate and unnecessary uh, when we are talking about the human condition in such a way. And what you really need to do kind of is just leave an unfiltered performance for the audience to experience. If you, you can really feel things, I think, clearly and more lucidly in black and white. I don't think it creates emotion if it's not there in the performance, but when you have performances like we had, yours, Jamie's, uh, Jude's, Judy's, all of you, um, it's just so much more lucid. You mm -hmm. kind of, I think it's almost like you take the frame out of the window and you're the, 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 the glass um, with, with emotions at least and black and white. So that was probably the key reason to doing that. Plus a kind of dual transcendental nature that you kind of feel with black and white. It's, it's neither the past or the future. It's not really, it kind of does both things. It's, it has a realism, and it, but it's also quite magical at the same time. It can be quite graphic um, and therefore easy to uh, uh, separate things that you don't need to kind of be there. But I would say it was certainly the kind of emotional immersiveness that, uh, that attracted us to the telling this story in, 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 in black and white. Yeah, but there's also there's a particular, you know, because you can do so many varying, there's many degrees of black and white, you know, Absolutely. it can look so different. Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful for the one that you guys landed on because I think we all look great in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we were like, oh, wow, thanks, guys. Um, but but what was it yeah. about this particular sort of resonance or this particular depth of black and white or that yeah that... No, I, that's really well spotted there Katrina and it's been something that people have kind of I've had a few conversations and some complaints and to some extent I remember one woman from the Basque country in Bilbao said I just it should have had grain it should have been much grittier I mean oh. he was so troubled at the time and I'm like ah. That's not what we wanted to do. I feel the drama was already there, but you would, we would be forcing drama uh, that's unnecessary, that's kind of, that felt like we would be taking, uh, we would be intrusive into the story and the emotion by adding something like that, kind of a grittiness or, a, 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 or grain into the picture. What we wanted to do certainly is, in a way, just show the heroism of, of, uh, of these characters. And, um, I also think we wanted to show it through the eyes of a of a of a, a small child, and I don't think children really see things in a gritty way. They their yeah. eyes are really wide and and full of joy and playfulness, and um, we felt we had to be playful with our framing. You know that there would be little things and little bits of details, and it it wouldn't exactly be your conventional framing. You would leave room to the side somewhere. And our black and white had to be glossy and it had mm. to be like a life magazine spread um, uh, or, uh, and it would have to have a certain clarity to it. So the cameras were not your, were a kind of medium format uh, camera and a large format lens. So um, very much like you see, you know, I think some of the most intimate uh, portraits are always done in, in photography are done in, in black and white and with a certain amount of clarity where you can see every little freckle um, yeah uh, but you see it lovingly it, um, and you see it, it kind of with adoration um, and 
in particular when you're treating a subject matter and an air, and a kind of area that is of modest means i think the more you do that the more i think you do justice to the kind of um the courage and the bravery and the and the and the parenthood um i know ken really likes henry cartier bresson and all his kind of decisive moments of 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 photography but i i really loved uh dorothea lang and how she used oh, to go yeah. through um kind of troubled areas in the us and she had an amazing kind of way of talking to a subject where she'd set up a large format camera and she'd just talk to people um and she'd make them feel comfortable and then she'd just snap when when she had to um and she's got some of the most haunting beautiful um uh images ever and and also they brought it i mean like i mean that's something completely different but her photographs brought about social change in a way as well yeah. she managed to get funding for kind of areas that were impoverished with those photographs and um what what i felt there was in uh, that quality is an amount of a certain amount of adoration and respect to your sub kind of the the characters and the subject matter that uh, we had to follow yeah well I, I think it speaks to that heroism that you were talking about before mm. you know and that's what i loved i mean you know especially there's that one shot when um when pa is at the back gate and he's speaking to the ira or the mm. uh, the guys and uh you know, the shot is from low down, but he looks like such a, a mountain, a titan and a hero, you know, and it's like you do, you think of your parents as as the tallest people in the room, as the smartest people in the room when you're that young. And it just, I loved how often you were able to frame the shots so that they did, they looked like, you know, the most important people to, to buddy, you know? I think your your scene when you say we're going now uh, is my favorite in the film and that we shot it so simply it's just such a simple close up of you but we were quite close we didn't we weren't far away um and i i mean we we were in, i was in tears through the viewfinder i mean i that was just such a kind of like uh, impactful like truly emotional uh, uh performance and you don't want to cut out of it. You know, mm. you want to shoot it simply. You want to be as unintrusive to a performance like that as, as possible. Um, I, I feel when I, when people say I really like the photography, I'm like, I did nothing because it is that, that, and that was the, the aim. It's, it's you guys. It, it's just it, every frame resonates with incredible emotion. Um, and, um, just such powerful storytelling that it was easy for me to do very little. Um, and, well, I think that's also what Ken asked of us in many ways. You know, he loves that kind of the stillness and just the purity mm. of truth, you know, and I think that's what we were all striving for, you know, stripping yeah. everything back and keeping it just very, very still, very simple, but very, very true. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, that's always the most impactful when you're watching something. Oh, certainly. Kind of, I, I, I hope people feel like they were at the viewfinder, really, when they watch the yeah. film. I mean, that's, that's all you can aim for, really. Um, well, it's beautiful because you, there, there's such a, a beautiful balance of those really intense close-ups. But then, you know, some of my favourite scenes as well are, are, you know, there's that scene when, um, when Pa tells Ma, you know, thank you, like you raised them. But the camera's way back in the other room, which I loved because it, again, it's, it's sort of these stolen, mm. stolen moments that you really get the sense of the child sort of being eavesdropping in on things, you know? Yeah. Um, and that juxtaposition, I think, which is what family is all about. There's always two things going on at the same time. Um, and, and something a child isn't aware of, um, uh, but I think that also comes out of that magic that you all had be between yourselves, I think, on set. Um, and that kind of how caring, I think, for, for me, it was so impressive watching how caring you were of young Jude. And um, uh, Hard not to go. What, uh, a, what, a, what a lovely little just 
ball of light he is. But I think, I think, you know, that extended to everybody. I mean, we, we, it was such a small crew, it was such a small cast, you know, we all, I think got very kind of, there was such a lovely feeling on set. You were running around here like the man in the big picture, not paying your taxes and spending all our money on horses. It's the building trade. I told you it doesn't work the normal way. I told you I had it covered. No, I was the one who had it covered. No, you had us paying three years of back tax. To keep you out of bloody jail. We're drowning in a debt. We're near done with the back tax. Ten pound a month for three bloody years. This is the time to think about making a new start. I know nothing else but Belfast. Exactly. There's a whole world out there. We can give these boys a better chance than we ever had. There's Commonwealth countries needing tradesmen. The government will give you assisted passage. We can get the whole family to the other side of the world for £10. We're living in a civil war. And I'm not here to protect my family. Do you see the film differently now that you're a mother, since we made it? Um, I don't know, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I, it's, it's funny. I definitely, I feel like more watching it with my mom was sort of the most really? impactful because yeah. my mom as well she wouldn't you know film wouldn't be her her mo her she's much more into music and um you know films always when i when i've been in things before she's like oh yeah you know it's nice she's fallen asleep many times but i think when she because she came to belfast and she came to see it and what she said was she was just like I just didn't want it to end, you know? And I think that was like the most beautiful compliment because that meant A, she stayed awake, <laughs> um, which, you know, is, is a big thing. Um, but she, you know, I think she just got so lost in it and so swept up by it. And, and that I think was a real, I think I've seen it sort of maybe differently because of that. I don't know, maybe. Um, I got... I got to show it to my parents after, oh, okay. in a really interesting way on this. Um, we, we were doing the, we, uh, Christmas, after Christmas, the lockdown happened. I went to Cyprus. I wasn't able to go to Cyprus over the summer because, of, because we were filming. So I hadn't seen my parents who were quite old. My father's 90, my mum's 81. Um, yeah. And we, we went for Christmas and the lockdown happened. So we just stayed. And we had to color correct the film and do the grade, but we were never ever allowed to be in the room anyway at, uh, to do the color correction with Ken, which we usually do. We would have to go in at separate times and I would get some time with the colorist and then, and then Ken would have some time with the colorist because of COVID, we had to stay apart. Um, so in the end, we did it remotely and Ken went in and spent his time in the, in the room and I would log in with a, um, uh, on 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 my computer, a calibrated monitor, and I would we would watch it together and go through things and and talk over over the phone while this was happening, kind of speaker phone to the room. Um, but when it was done, Ken said, oh, "You really need to see it in this in a in a cinema before we we sign off on this." So mm -hmm. I'm going to send you a DCP of this, which I found a cinema that would was obviously closed down. Um, yeah. And then, yes, we'll open it up. And I took my wife, my mom, and my dad, and in the middle of COVID, in lockdown, we sat in an empty cinema. Um, oh, wow. And watched the finished film um, together. And, and what did they think? Oh, they loved it. Um, I'm not quite sure how much, my mom, my mom has dementia, so I'm not quite sure how much um, kind of uh, she managed to follow. Uh, mm -hmm. But they did absolutely love it, and they, they certainly kind of had a different idea of what who Ken was after after that film. Yeah, um, but I think it was it was also kind of at that age. It just it also felt like I don't know how many times we'll go and see a film together, especially mine. Um, uh, we have left, so it was really a, a great kind of finish to the film um, for me. Um, at least then I could sign off and say, I think we're good, Ken. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> let's, 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 because that was the finished product. That's, that was it. That was now, well, let's go show this to the world. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, 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 you know, people have asked us many times about 
how did COVID impact and what were the things, but I never thought about it necessarily in terms of in the post, because that must have been really difficult to not being able to sort of be in the same room. And I mean, did it, did it, because it was also quite a quick turnaround, no? Very quick turnaround. Um, and it's also that the, that final bit of post is almost like the, um, the reward for the hard work in a funny way that you actually get to sit in a room and you're tweaking it quietly. You're not, you don't have the pressure of a schedule, etc. Although you do have a fixed amount of time, um, you're allowed to kind of gaze over it frame by frame and make adjustments um, and kind of then play it back and have a cup of tea and think about it. Um, and it, I had to lock myself up in my children's bedroom while they, without them kind of getting into the, turn the lights off and look at it on a, uh, on a monitor, which was a completely different um, experience. Uh, I'm sure. yeah. But um, I think we, I think generally on the film, we made a, we turned the limitations of COVID and, and our kind of schedule and budget into um, uh, we did. I think we overcame the limitations. They they almost became the best qualities of the film. Um, well, that's what I was going to say. I think having those restrictions forces you to be extra creative and forces yeah. you to make decisions. You know, I I think I think about especially the way everything was shot in terms of how expansive it looks in the film but yet how little we had when we were making it. I mean, we had basically two locations, right? Yes. And well, every, sorry, yeah. Do you want to expand upon how that, how you were able to make that look like so many different? I mean, I think Una has to take a lot of credit uh, for the editing there a little bit, uh, you know, because I, I had a, we had a question in Los Angeles last week where someone said, you know, the church scene, it just seems so kind of um, like you're there. It's just the sweat and the, you just like it, it's so close and intimate and and guttural, et cetera. I'm like, well, we only had three actors. We had a very small church. And because of COVID, we couldn't have a congregation. So it literally is that. <laughs> um, you could look over to the left or right. So um, we just made a meal out of it in the end. But, 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 um, it, but it works so well. <laughs> you know, you don't feel the missing congregation. You don't sense that at all. Well, that's the great illusional part of, 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 of filmmaking. Um, uh, you know, the hospital felt the same way too. Um, mm. You know... It, that you didn't really need much, a few, you know, a few, a few beds and a, um, <laughs> um, a few patients, one or two, you know, it was, it was really like that, that actually meant that, um, and even the dappled light that kept kind of changing everything, you just feel time ticking in a way. And um, it starts, it has that thing we talked about earlier, how transcendental it feels, um, mm -hmm. kind of the bridge of two different worlds. I think that's, um, when you're quite minimalist and you strip things back and you, 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 you kind of let things happen, you kind of listen more than you talk in a funny way. It, and there is such a thing in filmmaking where you're kind of more of a listener than a talker in the way you make the film, that, some th that things happen and you hear things and you observe things a bit better. Um, yeah. That's beautiful. I always think there's um, two schools of uh, DPs um in my experience uh, and this could be wrong but I there's the people who paint with light and are very gentle and then there are people who kind of take control of the light and I've always um I, I definitely think you're a painter with the light you're you're such a oh, gentle right. soul and and you know I, I guess that that really speaks to the listening and um so in terms of that how did you get into like where where was like how did you get your start? What was the sort of impetus for you deciding that this was your calling? Uh, I went. I didn't know much about what cinematography is or cinema is growing up in in Cyprus, but I um, really loved maths and I really loved art. And uh, my parents said you can go and be you can go study painting at St Martin's School of Art if that's what you really want to do. Um, wow. So. Uh, 
I I went to the foundation course and you try you try film and you try theater and you try sculpture and you try all these things. And that was it. I kind of they said cinema and that was that was it. Um, and everyone wanted to be a director and I wanted to be a cinematographer because I was more interested in the images you make in filmmaking rather than the 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 kind of um, creating the narrative. Um, mm -hmm. um, and it just slowly went from there. I mean, I kind of graduated from there, did another postgraduate course in Los Angeles, got my first film, which was quite difficult to have a low budget um, film in Los Angeles was my first film um, in downtown LA um, in and amongst the kind of kind of really near uh, Skid Row. It was called yeah. Camera Obscura um, and it was about a crime scene photographer who is overwhelmed by the violence that he sees in crime scenes and he starts changing these photographs in his uh, so that the victims look alive in their photo. Quite a gritty, dark kind of uh, neo-noir film. But what really kind of made an impact to, to me, we were, you know, you'd see the, like how the homeless lived in Los Angeles. And it really, you know, um, you're trying to do something that is kind of creative and this and that, but you're, you're living amongst a real problem. I remember we wrapped one evening on a night shoot and I, we were, you know, we all helped on that, that film. We, you know, I was loading the truck and so was the director and we were all kind of doing our bit to, to, to finish. And we, we put some music on in the car park where we were loading the trucks. And a homeless person came up to me and said, can you please turn the music down? Some of us are trying to sleep here. And you really realize, my God, that's, this is your home. This really is kind of, kind of that, kind of, it made me feel very grateful to have a job to have a home um, while making my first film. Like that this, there, there are way more important things and that kind of maybe some of these themes are the ones that you really need to be concentrating on. Mm. Um, um, uh, and I guess that ties in with a lot of the kind of themes that maybe I think Ken was always interested in, um, going back to kind of why we had a, I think a similar, um, you know, I feel that with Ken, that, you know, a gratitude, you know, for, yeah. uh, you know, the kind of getting through uh, life and being okay and, um, um, and the privilege of filmmaking. Um, uh, so. Uh, I think it's, it's that thing of the hero, the heroism of the everyday, right? That every yeah. single, you know, just just being yeah. able to get through and to make it, instead of it being about these grand, you know, gestures or the war, or things like that. It's like no, actually, the the yeah. beauty of humanity is in those, you know, little struggles and getting through them and, and sort of overcoming them. Um, we kept talking with Ken about this this kind of phrase and I think it was from no I know it's it's from the Dalai Lama and uh, he talked to, when he talks about living in exile and how what it's like to of her life in exile um, and how he never kind of got angry at what happened with China and he talked about the joyful participation in the sorrows of life um, and that does that 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 was a that was really the the theme for us um, uh, of this film um, as you you know as you said the everyday heroes and that mm. participation and that kind of like, I think, you know, for the characters and just that protection of childhood, I think is such a wonderful um, thing to be able to portray and, and, and how well you portrayed it as well, Katrina, yeah. because that really, it just, your performance in that respect just sings from the screen. Um, Oh, thank you. I, I thought we were talking about Jude there. I was like, yes, he's amazing. Um, yeah, but no, but thank you. You know, I well, for me, it's it's. I mean, so much of that was just on the page, and you just you you just hope that you get given a character or a a, a script that has such good writing and that allows you to come from a place of real 
I don't know, it's, it's funny, but like honesty or truth and, and it doesn't feel contrived and you don't feel like you have to put a hat on a hat and mm. you can just really speak from your heart. And, you know, I think one of the things, like when I first read it, you know, I, I, I felt like I understood her. I understood yeah. exactly where she was coming from and, and that, you know, how difficult it was, how difficult it is just for ordinary people to just make it through any situation let alone when you have violence come right to your doorstep um you know and I I I, when I knew I was going to get you know it's going to be playing her I started you know listening to all of these testimonials these interviews of women from Belfast and from these streets and just the just the ordinariness of them Mm -hmm. but also the the huge heart that they had and their their ability to have gone through something so momentous and yet stay sane and stay strong and i don't know it's 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 incredible when you look at at what they've all had to go through i mean it's you know and i guess in a way having grown up with sort of the in in the later years of that and and seeing how it still continued and and yet how ordinary life just still has to go on you know there's such a you feel such a weight of 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 responsibility to kind of honor those women or honor those people you know what well, what were your favorite things about working with young Jude oh <laughs> everything oh. oh it's just you know, I, I mean, again, I suppose it's like what we were talking about, you know, the the just the beauty of youth. I mean, he's just so enthusiastic and wide eyed and, you know, never complained, never was never down. Like he was just so excited about every day and everything that we got to do. And, you know, it's so infectious that I mean, I like to think that I'm a slightly big kid anyway, but um <laughs> you know, it's, it's, we're so lucky to do what we do. It's such, it can be such a playful thing. You know, that's, that's what I try and and do in my work anyway, is just sort of be show up and be ready to sort of play whatever it is. Um, And he, he was able to be super prepared, which is, you know, not always the case, coupled with just so free and so enthusiastic and, and, you know, it was so much fun and to watch Ken as well, be so patient with him and yet enjoy, like, I think that's the, one of the things I take away so much was my memory of Ken, how much fun he was having. You know, he was just, you could see how, how happy it was making him and how he would giggle on the other side of the camera, you know, that like, like you could hear it so often. Um, you know, it was, I guess that's that's a good qu- question um, because you've worked with him on so many different projects. Did you see a marked difference between how he was on this set compared to other sets? Um, he's different on every film because he's got a different responsibility in, in each one and a different story to tell. Um, uh, I think this was definitely the most joyful and playful I've seen him and for obvious reason. Um, but I could, I could sense the underlying kind of responsibility he felt to say something that wasn't like, if it's, if it's about you and from you so much, you then have to then, where do you separate that and become the director? Yeah. Um, And that's really hard. It's easy to say, but, um, it's very hard to do where you have to be an objective uh, person in this um, and say this, it was my story until I wrote it. And then the minute I wrote it and it's in the script, I'm now the director that has to uh, separate myself and how can I be the best director I can? So I thought that was one of the things that uh, I could sense that he, he did and he did masterfully in a mm. way. Um, that he just then took on that 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 role. He's he's capable in in an instant 
Um, I mean, when he plays Poirot, he's like, in an instant, he's, he's acting. And then he'll turn around to me and say, pan a little to the right. And then he'll give a script note to the actor in full mustache regalia. So I've seen him kind of multitask um, um, uh, really, really well. But this was, this was something quite, um, uh, uh, quite different. I mean, Jude, Jude was, had his first film, what, age nine, 10 now we know, but when, did, when was your first film and what was your memory of it? Uh, much, much later. Um, so the first film I, I, I mean, the first film I did anything, I had uh, a few days on Super 8 where I played Dead Mom, um, <laughs> which was my very first job. But one of the great things about that was uh, I, I, I think I was four days on that, but two of the days was just with JJ with a Super 8 camera. And we just spent the day going through different scenarios and he was filming like it was his home videos, which was super interesting because that's also how he started. Um, like he grew up making these sort of Super 8 films and, um, you know, it was really, even though it was such a small role uh, that, that didn't require much, it was just a really great, way to spend some time with a, an amazing yeah. director and and do all that um my first speaking part <laughs> took a while i think uh i think was escape plan um which is uh, a, a movie with uh arnold schwarzenegger and sylvester stallone and i play arnold's daughter stroke cia agent as you do <laughs> very different came, film. sorry very different films, both of those. Very different. You know, I, I came to acting so, so much later in life than most people. Um, it was something I was studying right out of school. And then I, I got scouted and made a detour into fashion for, for 10 years. So it was, you know, when I came back, I, I was 30 and starting from scratch in L.A., which was, you know, quite a scary thing because I think at that point you know you're also there's a stupid sort of narrative that you're already sort of finished by that point and if you haven't sort of gotten your foot in the door at that point you you should forget about it but you know I was very lucky I had a few people who really took a chance on me and and gave me opportunities and and I think the other thing at that point in my life I'd lived a lot and I'd traveled the world a lot and I'd experienced a lot and I think I I, I had something to say at that point that I don't think I would have if I'd come straight out of college at 20 and or 19 or whatever it would have been. Um, so yeah, it's been a slightly late, <laughs> late start, but uh, you know, I think with everything, these things happen the way they're supposed to in life, you know? Yeah. It seems that there's no wrong time, is there? It's always the right time. Exactly. Um, yeah. It certainly felt that way with Belfast because it was that it was just the right time to do something like this. Uh, I mean, we were months. we were so lucky with when it happened, how it happened, and the fact that we we got to film this right between two lockdowns. And I think if we'd been a couple of weeks later, we probably wouldn't have succeeded in finishing. Or if we waited till now, I don't think we would have made anywhere near the same film because. I don't know, I'm sure you felt the same way, but it really, it, there was a kind of heightened sense of um, awareness of just kind of how precious things were, how, uh, uh, you know, a sense of kind of, you know, being, it was, it's such a communal uh, uh, um, profession, filmmaking, um, that, that you then lose. I mean, like you, you we can't, you, we can't work from home, for no. example. Um, <laughs> like some of us, we've seen terrible examples of when actors work from home over the <laughs> over the lockdown. <laughs> exactly, it's just impossible. So um, it, it was, it just felt really heightened, and uh, uh, like the, I certainly felt a big appreciation 
for being uh, back with my film family at that point. No, completely. I think every, I think everybody was just feeling so sort of gratitude for being able to work, but also gratitude to being able to work on something that was also yeah. so special. So thank you so much, Harris. I wish we were able to do this in in a room together with a glass of wine, but this was absolutely lovely. We'll we'll get that glass of wine together soon. And uh, thank you everyone for joining and for watching. This has been the process uh, with Deadline. Thank you, Katrina. It's been a pleasure.